Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Young Zhao. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. It's very kind of you. It's, uh, it's very good to be um, in New Jersey. And you guys have this parkway, right? <laughs> uh, that's P-A-R-C-C -C now, right? The New Jersey Parkway. It's, uh, it's good to have that. And uh, glad you were ready for that, right? It's, uh, so thank you for having me here. And uh, I have to tell you this, though. A few years ago, I, was, uh, I, I came to the state very often because my son went to school here. And he went to school at, down at in Heightstown, Petty. Uh, and that was not because I liked New Jersey or liked private schools. It was more because of George Bush. And, uh, and uh, George still owes me some money and for that reason. Uh, because uh, when George Bush passed there, the No Child Left Behind, and we were happy to live in Michigan. And one morning, my son, uh, he was in eighth grade uh, in a public school in Okmos, Michigan. And he said, we went to this great American restaurant called uh, Crackle Barrel. I don't know if you guys have that. It's uh, <laughs> the, uh, the quintessential American experience and, uh, in, in the, by the highway. So we were having some of you know, the best breakfast you could ever have in, uh, in the US. And, uh, and he said, Did Dad, I know how to how to get good test scores now on this thing called a MEEP at that time. It's called the Michigan Education uh, Assessment of Progress, something like that. And, uh, and it's called a writing. It's the writing thing that got, and they have. Uh, you know, Michigan actually had to get rid of that writing part because uh, nobody could really get good scores on that. So it's, uh, and that's what you do. When you get rid of it, you have 50% that cannot pass park, just change into something else. You park this way. Anyway, so. So he said, I said, how do you do it? He said, well, you just get right, right one, one statement, topic, sentence, add in three kind of supporting pieces of evidence. You get fours and fives. I said, man, that, that's, that's the end of your writing career. Let's get out of here. And so that was when the, when the testing came down, you know, to when the standards came down to the states. So I said, you got to go to New Jersey. That's probably the heaven that they don't have standards yet. Now, little I know, and you guys have it now, okay. And, uh, uh, but anyway, so he went to this, uh, school. And the, he was a, a very good story to tell because uh, he, he represents what I want to share with you today is about what makes good education because everybody wants to fix education. I think we've been fixing education for a long time. You know, we have uh, now something called the Common Core. We have now you have Park. Um, Oregon, where I live now, we have smarter and balanced, but I can tell you it's not smarter or balanced, but it's, uh, it's you know, we have this nice names, you know, all this stuff, you know. You know, I've been, people have been arguing with me and say, you know, you are so against uh, the common core, you know. That's, for, that's one of the reasons people don't normally invite me to speak. They said, you know, why do you talk, keep going against the common core? I said, you know, I said, people said, don't you want standards? Yes, of course I want standards, but I just don't like common core standards. And uh, if they were not common or core, I would be completely fine. That's the problem is they are, they're common and core, and that, that's the reason. But, you know, the whole thing about this is, is that we have this concept about uh, uh, readiness, right? And we talk about college and career readiness. So I want to challenge the idea about uh, what does readiness, readiness mean and what kind of readiness do we want? And uh, so I'm going to show you this. Uh, uh, that's a bottle of wine. I'm not going to show you that. It's, it's, I, I, somewhere I, I took that, and, uh, and I was going to um, so find out what um, I was going to show you this. This is my, my daughter. And I just dropped her off in, uh, in a college in England. So she's going to college now in Scotland, at University of Edinburgh, and studying uh, literature and uh, philosophy. And so, of course, people were asking, well, she was ready for college, but uh, is she ready for career? What kind of career will she have? I said, well, I live in Eugene. We don't have many jobs in that area, but I'm not worried about And uh, because I knew my son, for example, he was, uh, uh, thanks to uh, education in the petty, he was very ready for college. He, was, uh, he got into the University of Chicago, which is a very expensive college, as you know. And, uh, but he was not so ready. He did not get any scholarship for that. So that was the sad part. And uh, I had to pay for everything. Now, when he went there and he was going to study what almost every Chinese child should study, it's called economics. And uh, so he was going to become a banker, investment banker. So that was a good idea. I said, well, that's, that's you know, keep up with the Chinese traditions. After about two years at college, Chicago, and uh, 
He came back to talk to me. I said, Dad, I'm not going to do economics anymore. I said, why? He said, well, you know, because there are too many darn Asians in economics. I said, no, okay. You should have known that before. But anyways, I said, uh, that's not really a good reason. You know, just don't avoid your own kind. And uh, the, uh, I said, no, tell me a real reason. He said, well, my math is just not as good as theirs. I said, that's good. Just get away from what you're not good at. Okay. And I said, no. I said, no. What do you want to do? I said, what? what? He said, I, I just took this great class. Fascinating. I said, what it is? It's art history. And uh, I said, okay, sure. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just passionate about this topic. And this, this topic is about, is photography art? I said, that's a very fascinating topic. Let's go for it. And uh, so he did, and he did. He studied this then. I said, just go. I said, but... Under one condition, I said, uh, just when you graduate, don't come back to live in my basement. <laughs> uh, so uh, I said, uh, that's my condition. That's my definition of a good education. A good education keeps other people's children out of their basement. <laughs> so I don't care about college readiness, career readiness is out of the basement readiness. And, uh, <laughs> and if, uh, if we can, we've done a good job, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, I think you know, we can argue about anything. We can argue about education, purpose, we can all kind of philosophical debate. But I think very few people would uh, argue against the concept that a good education produces independent people. Independent. Whatever that independent can mean, right? Independence can mean financial independence, social independence, psychological independence, that you are independent somehow. You know, we will come to come back to our basement you know, occasionally, but not there all the time. It's, uh, and so, so I want to use that to check against this idea that is our education producing independent, independent citizens, independent members of communities, independent family members in, in many ways? How are we doing in that regard? And what kind of education can we actually produce, can we create to do that? I mean, all the reforms we talked about, from uh, No Child Left Behind to Race to the Top, all those kind of things, you know. But by the way, you know, uh, they're not, you guys don't have mountains. You have no place to race to, right? You don't really have a top to, to go to. But uh, that might be New York. You can race all your superintendents to New York, but that's a different story. Now, uh, now the, so, so think about that. All of this are well-intentioned actions to make our education system better for every child. I, I really truly believe that. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't believe. I, I think we all want a better education for our children. So we've been fixing the curriculum. We've been fixing assessment. We've been fixing pedagogy. We've been fixing leadership. But are we just, uh, are we doing the right thing or are we just doing the wrong thing more right? That's the question to ask. You know, we all talk about data. You know, we think about, you know, if we fix this thing, it might get us there. But sometimes just fixing something might not work. Okay? Because now, you know, look at all of our, our education reform, our efforts. Maybe we're just improving something when we actually need to invent something. You know, instead of trying to improve, maybe we need to transform something. That, that's something I'm going to make a, a, a suggestion for. It's like, um, you know, right now, you know, the, we talk a lot about data, about evidence. But any kind of theory or any kind of action driven by data can stop working sometimes. Can stop working. So when we, we could have a lot of blind faith in some data, but that might not work. Let me just give you an example. I mean, uh, uh, just now Susan gave me such high praises as a professor. He's a great, you know... He's a good speaker, all those kind of things, which might be true, but the first thing I define myself is I am a, a failed Chinese peasant. <laughs> Just a very unsuccessful Chinese farmer. You know, I was uh, born and raised in a Chinese village in Sichuan province. In my village, the common core was driving the water buffalo, and I wasn't good at that, and I decided to get away from it. And, this, uh, and that's like uh, my son's, just go away. If you're not good at something, don't do it. Just, you know. I I'm glad my father did not give me remedial lessons on water buffalo driving. As, uh, uh, but think, as a farmer, but there was something, you, know, you grew up in the farm, you just kept thinking about farming things. You can't get away from that. So I'm thinking about data. So if you are, think about this scenario. 
A farmer buys a chicken and feeds the chicken at 7 o'clock in the morning. Or if you get up early, you can 6.30, it works too. But uh, anyway, so, so think about yourself as a chicken. Uh, you're collecting data, okay? And you, every morning, you, your chicken goes to the farmer at uh, 7 o'clock and gets fed. It's a pretty good deal, right? It's called return. Because, and then, so you, 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 you go there, and day one, you get one data point. Day two, two data points. Day three, you go on and go on and go on. So every day confirms that hypothesis. If I get up early and 7 o'clock, I will get fed. That's a pretty good hypothesis, right? That's, that's how we would think about this then. So for 360 days, 363 days, 364 days, a chicken gets fed 7 o'clock in the morning. All those data prove that's true. Until one day, maybe Christmas or, I don't know, Thanksgiving. And with China, we don't do any of those, but maybe Spring, uh, spring Festival. What? Some, someday. The farmer decides to eat the chicken. And the chicken goes to the farmer 7 o'clock in the morning on that day. All those past data, those theories, hypothesis stops working, right? You go there, get killed. So, so that's, that's basically, it's a, it's a, so are we sometimes in history, history plays jokes on human beings a lot of times. You know, we think we're doing, we're counting on something all the time until it stops working. It's, it's not nothing, nothing new, but how often does those things happen? It doesn't really happen very often. It actually, it happens once in a while. Once that happens, we reach a point what we call a paradigm shift might be needed. A paradigm shift might be needed. If you think about in our work, you know, that, like human history has done this a couple of times in, in life. You know, this, uh, this is, uh, think about jobs. This is about uh, the past 200 years of uh, of work, of, and this is from uh, economist uh, Richard Florida's data, 200 years, and you can see the decline, the sharp decline of farming skills. Farming, that's from 1800 to over about 200 years. So you saw this cliff somewhere there. That's where a chicken was killed. So if we kept trying to become, that's 1830. You say, okay, I don't believe this then this, this industrial revolution, and nobody called the industrial revolution at that time. Nobody knew it was a revolution. People said, okay, let's have more farmers, you know, and it would work. Might work. If my father did not say anything else, 1970s, actually, he couldn't say anything else, is that uh, you know, being a farmer would have been much better for me, honestly, at that time, because there was no hope. But then you see the decline. And then you see the rise of the working class, the blue line, and that's in the 1850s because uh, farming was uh, apparently not needed. You know, technology becomes better and uh, we have the Industrial Revolution. A few people create a lot of jobs for millions of us. So we become the working class employees. And you see that decline somewhere? 1970s, you know, a sharp decline now, the working class. And that's where we might be seeing the change. That's there, actually, 1970. It might be the time the chicken went to the, the farmer. That was the time. So what are we thinking today? Let's look at how our education are doing in terms of keeping our children out of our basement. And we are not doing very well. We're not doing very well. They are, in the, for example, we saw some data a few years ago that says uh, uh, American, about 53% of our recent college graduates are Jobless or underemployed. Jobless is easier to understand. Underemployed is harder to understand, but basically means that uh, you either do not have a full-time job or you are doing a job that does not require a college degree. For example, if you go to New York or maybe here, you see a lot of uh, 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 chemistry majors, biology majors work in the coffee shop or in the restaurants. That's why last week I was very proud uh, to Alongst that in, in Netherlands. I was in Amsterdam. I said, okay, you know, you should come to the US now. You know, our, our currency is strong, but we have the best educated generation of bartenders. You know, it's, uh, it's very, very good. You know, we got a lot of them, right? You, we have a lot of people back in their parents' basement and with the average college date of $23,000 in our, our basement and the, these people. And uh, this, that's, we actually have a new term. It's called the, the boomerang generation. 
Gen the boomerang generation, I've heard about the generation B, not generation Y, generation X, uh, boomerang generation. Boomerangs takes from the Australian boomerang, remember the Aboriginal people? You throw them out and they come back to you. And they never go away. That's what we have. That's, but this is actually, it's not an American problem. It's actually, it's a global problem. In Korea, their president says, skip college. That's, there's no hope there. And uh, in China, graduates 7.49 million college students a year right now. And uh, European countries look at uh, Spain and uh, England. They all have the same issue, South Africa. And uh, so if you look at some of the, the data we, we gather, even just last um, Last uh, of, of um, this year, we're seeing people complaining about in Australia. Uh, I was there about three weeks ago to so talk about youth unemployment hits a new high as people lock out of workforce. The U.S. is talking about national crisis of youth unemployment. The England is talking about 20-year high, record high of youth unemployment, and China says youth unemployment a crisis in the making. And Korea says 15-year high. This is nowhere. Nobody is having a good time. You know, youth unemployment. It's, it's a serious problem. It's, uh, now, does this mean that we have not educated them well? Or have we have not educated them enough? Or does it mean we have given them maybe the wrong kind of education? It's, uh, maybe it's time to change. Are we educating them more? Should we do more or should we change? I think it's not because we have undereducated these people. This generation of children, globally speaking, have more years of education than any previous generation, than any, as a human being. We're not there yet, but more. However, I think they've been miseducated. They've miseducated for a society that no longer exists. And maybe have shifted that we have to rethink about it. So what did our society, what did our schools were designed to do? Our education was designed to do a different kind of job, to, to produce employees, to, to produce people who would work on places like this. <coughs> you see this, right? But these jobs are gone. These jobs are not here anymore. These jobs, if you look at all these changes, this is called something very simple, automation. Technology, yesterday you had a Yahoo speaker here, always plays tricks with us, technology. Technology always redefines the value of talent, of knowledge, of skills. What used to be valuable may not be valuable anymore. What, not, you know, what used to be less valuable may become valuable. This is how we shift, uh, how technology changes. And education always tries to catch up to the redefined society. And very slowly, we catch up. And sometimes we don't. If we don't, we live in a pretty miserable life. In a, if we try to change, it might work. So automation. Automation is changing a lot of things. And this is what uh, two computer scientists have written a book about this from MIT called uh, The Second Machine Age. That is, we have arrived at a different time. The second machine age is in a contrast to the first machine age. Second machine age is really talking about how digital technology is transforming our societies. And digital technology deals with information, communication, a lot of human skills. So we see in the US, a lot of jobs have been substituted by machines. Not only assembly line jobs, we see other kind of routine jobs being replaced, accounting. You know, accountants, it's, when I first came to this country in the 1990s, we actually used to have H&R Block accounting agents sitting in the mall. Remember doing your tax? They're gone. Remember, those were actually very good paying, good paying jobs. They, they were gone. Were, TurboTax has taken care of that. It's, uh, and now you've seen that. What, what other jobs are, have disappeared? Post office, have you seen that? That job is actually is very in danger. And banking, bank tellers, you actually don't go talk to those people anymore. Uh, airline agents, have you noticed that? Travel agents, uh, a lot of those jobs. And uh, amazingly, uh, even in the US, we still have, a, I mean, this is actually very shocking to many people. We have a surplus of law school graduates in this country. Law school, I mean, but don't worry, in America is still keeping the tradition of suing each other as much as possible. We still have that going. And, uh, but we just don't need many law school graduates. 
because a lot of law school graduates, you know, do research. You know, you know how hard it was to do research without digital databases, digital search engines? Now it's much easier to do. We just don't need that. And now what's coming, and I heard yesterday, I think uh, Dr. Reese was telling me, maybe you were telling me about, uh, talk about uh, Uber, uh, how it's disruptive. Now actually it's something even worse. Let's not debate about Uber. It's Google car. Do you know the Google car is coming to a neighborhood near you? Okay. And it's a, it's a car that does not need a human driver. Let's just think about this thing, okay. A car that does not need a human driver. All our transportation infrastructure is built around a human driver. Now imagine the kind of jobs, number of jobs will be lost. Uber drivers, limousine drivers, taxi drivers, bus drivers. By the way, in your school, you don't need bus drivers anymore. Your kids just walk into the bus in, by themselves and just, uh, and then, that's the first line of jobs lost. What's the second line of jobs lost? Can you imagine? Drivers, instructors, drivers, educators, drivers, ed. And your DMV, do you guys call DMVs? Those issues, driver's licenses, you don't need them, you know? And then, then the more direct cost is that it will be uh, those who make traffic lights, those who make rear view mirrors, make, uh, they, they make uh, gas pedals, they make steering wheels. We don't need any of those, those, those stuff anymore. And we will not need as many, uh, you know, like uh, police cameras or police people. We don't need a lot of police anymore. They have nobody to arrest. You can drink as much as you want. You don't have to be arrested. It's a, they have nobody to give tickets to. And they, that's not a problem anymore. You, know, you cannot arrest Google, you know, all this stuff. It's a, and there will be fewer accidents, you know, when there's, until Google runs in the Microsoft car. They'll have a fight. But that's, not, that's, a, that's a different thing. No. think about that. Car insurance companies will be redefined. Auto insurance, all of those things. Insurance agents. If you are pursuing lines of work in that domain, actually insurance agents are disappearing anyway because of it's easier to file claims now with all the different kind of processes. So it's really fascinating to rethink about this process. So we've lost lots of, lots of, lots of jobs to machines. Uh, if we do not lose the jobs to machines, we can lose to other countries because we live in the age of globalization. Age of globalization is called the death of distance, that jobs can be done anywhere on the globe. The criteria is that, is it done cheaper than in one place? And in this world right now, there are plenty of places that have millions of people, if not billions of people, who would cost much less to do the same job than in the United States of America. In the US, we now on average, think about our spending too, on average we spend over $115,000 per child for K-12 schools in the U.S., national average. I bet New Jersey spends a little bit more, you know, because uh, uh, you should spend even more. But anyway, uh, that's a lot of money. But don't, I'm not saying cut your budget, okay. Get the more money, you should be, we should be spending like $5 million per student, but that's a different story. That average is not, most countries, China maybe 10,000 for 12 years, India maybe 3,000 for 10 years. Now are we giving our children the skills that's worth 10 times more of the spending? That's a simple question. And by the way, that's why in the US I've always found it's funny and silly that we want to outscore Chinese students. By the way, that's impossible. China's been practicing that for 2,000 years, don't even try that. It's a, even if you did, that's the same skill. That's not going to worth the hundred thousand dollar more, ten times. It's impossible. It's just it's just nonsense. It won't work. You know. So so now we have two questions for you to think about. We lost those jobs. Our kids are back in our basement because they were doing things that can be done by machines or can be done cheaper in other places. What kind of education are we giving our children that will prepare them to have skills, knowledge, talents that cannot be replaced by machines or be done cheaper? in other places. Where do we go from here? And what kind of education got us here? The kind of education that got us here was a very simple traditional model of, of education. The traditional paradigm of education, if I just do it very simply, is very much like this. It is a, a sausage making model. That is we grant everybody, re disregard all individual differences, put into the system, hopefully in the end, you'll conform to our standards. 
So in the end, all our education outcome was prescribed and predetermined. We call them employable skills, or we can call whatever, readiness skills, you know, remember those readiness? By the way, readiness is an interesting concept that in this country, ever, you have to be ready. You know, like you're, like, you're ready for kindergarten, ready for first grade, ready for, for, for second year. You'll never live a life. You just always be ready for next time. You know, just it's, a, it's a, you know, then college ready, career ready, death ready, you know, all this kind of stuff. So we, we do this. You know, you actually in America, we have companies kept calling you. I mean, I just uh, turned 50. They kept, don't you want to be ready to die? You know, leave some money for your kids? You know, those companies, uh, insurance stuff. So I like this, ready in this concept. It's uh, always be ready, but never live a real life. But anyway, so that's the, well, talk about, you know, readiness implies one mindset that's called employment mindset you are ready to means you fit in to what other people expect you to do i don't know about you in the state of oregon where i live now we have this thing called readiness kindergarten readiness assessment and our governor was pretty proud of it but now he's removed and they said well you know and uh, not for that reason if you can uh, if it were for that reason, I'd be happier. But anyway, so, so we create these tests, you know, kids reading letters, all those readiness. You know, if you think about it, from an education standpoint of view, a child does not need to be ready for school. The school should be ready for any child. Right? When you think about But why do we assess them? Why do we assess them? Because we expect them to do a job in school. Not education, to do a job, you know, that's, that's something. And by the way, I found some of the standards was quite fascinating. I was reading the standard, I think it was Maryland. Anyone from Maryland? No, okay, no one comes from Maryland. Okay. But anyway, so Maryland, they have, a, they have one standard called uh, uh, for kindergarten readiness, being able to walk in a straight line. Really, and uh, stay awake during the day. It was quite, kind of cool, you know, standards. And uh, especially, you know, I thought, you know, uh, being able to walk in a straight line, so what do you do when you get caught by a cop? That's, uh, they get a head start. That's good. That's good. Okay. Now, this is our old paradigm. We prescribe the knowledge, the content, the skills you need to have to be successful for something else, to find employment. And how we do that? We talk to business people. We talk to others. We get a bunch of old people. You know, you have to be old to be included in those curriculum commissions because otherwise, you know, it's, you, otherwise how we, you have no expert. Remember, there's are people all about the past. So we cascade together, dream up what you will need in the future based on our past. Okay? Which was okay. No, seriously, it was okay. If the society does not change, that's a good prediction. And that actually used to work. You know, like Ren in my village until 1970s, we, we, it was a good bet. Those guys actually know driving the water buffalo was a good thing. And the society didn't change, didn't change. And if you lived in Michigan in the 1950s, you want your kids to ninth grade work for General Motors. That was not, that's, not, that's a good bet. In a society that does not change, it's good. Like chicken, remember? Day two, day three, that was good. But maybe we have arrived at the time this model no longer works. That's what I was showing you all the data. This model, this called the employee mindset model, does not work anymore. You cannot try to homogenize everybody to have similar skills to find a job there. The jobs do not exist. We need different kind of people to recreate a different society. And where would this new juice come from? Where's the new fuel? The new fuel precisely lies in the individual differences of human beings. I want to invite you to stand up, not the Pledge of Allegiance, to sing a song with me, okay? And the song is called uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Can you do that? You want to do it? Sure, well, if, don't worry, the internet doesn't work, so I can't really make it work, okay? But you know the song, right? You remember the song? Uh, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a what? And what happened? Nobody liked him, right? He was put into special education. <laughs> because by the standard standard, the standard color of red of reindeers is black. Right? The, black, the, 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 the more black you are, your nose are, the better you are. You, you, you score higher on park, you know. <laughs> imagine, imagine, uh, imagine park is a uh, assessment of the blackness of your nose. 
Rudolph is the horrible guy, you know. It's a, he messed up the whole state. <laughs> but, 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 but then, on the foggy Christmas Eve, Santa Claus was looking for a GPS. <laughs> and the red nose worked. And Rudolph suddenly went down history. God, you know, it's, it's, reindeers are very mean people to each other. It's, it's, uh, and everybody who read him, you remember, that was a good thing. It's, uh, so let's think about this. When Google Car gets rid of all those jobs, what kind of opportunities does it create? It's like Rudolph. Like on the foggy Christmas Eve, brings new opportunities. The Google car creates new opportunities. Like what? Like the first thing I can think, if you don't need to drive anymore, you guys notice how boring our car design is? In, in turn, in, inside, how uncomfortable? It's all forward looking, you know, with the driver. Now, if you don't need a driver, I think cars should be redesigned internally. You can put a hot top in it. <laughs> right? Put a bar inside. I, I think, I, I really think, put a classroom, a conference room. You would actually redefine, then reimagine what the car can do as a mobile office, mobile classroom, mobile restaurant, mobile spa. That would be just beautiful. But who, we need people to rethink like that. It's a, and actually, if we don't need a driver, actually, now I even think about from here, driving, you know, take a car from here to New York City. You can have your personal chef and a personal beautician do your fingernails or everything. Stuff, you know. That was just amazing stuff. You know. Just imagine the whole thing entirely changed the idea. And of course, you can get all the big city parking space would be unnecessary because cars would just find a place to park in cheaper. Maybe you guys should buy land, but all the Google cars come park here. It's cheaper, you know. They just find their own way here and just go back, you know. It's, it's, it's very easy. It's, uh, I think we need to rethink about new opportunities. Let's not focus on what technology has done to us. Let's look at what technology has recreated us. So how do we think about this? So let me go back to the idea about individual differences. This individual human difference is the saving grace for us in the future. Individuals, human beings are born different. We all have different talents, different skills, and uh, but traditionally, we did not really pay attention to that as asset. We paid attention to them. You know, when Howard Gardner came up with this idea of multiple intelligences, and we were, mostly, really most of us were thinking about how they learn differently. What I want to bring out here is to say, human beings are differently talented. You have different propensities to learn different things. Those we call a language smart might be better learning a foreign language and faster. And those with math can do the same. And those with arts, those with music, those with people, they can all have different talents. But that difference really means one important thing, that no one is great at everything. Same thing as Rudolph. Rudolph's nose cannot be both black and red at the same time. You know, a, so that's, that's the thing. So we have these differences. A student comes to you with differences. Our traditional model is to homogenize them, to actually overlook the differences. And the difference comes to schools a lot of times we consider as deficit. If you look at our gardeners, this, this whole thing, our school, math and language, that's it. If you happen to be good in both, you are considered A students. If you're not, you are the root of. We're gonna fix you, remediation, that's all those kind of things. But not only that. We're also born with different desires, different passion, different interest, and different motivation. Uh, Stephen Rice from Ohio State University suggested this. Human beings are driven by 16 different motivators. Different, where everybody has different profile. We cannot be driven by everything. So some of us are more interested in power. Well, look at the lineup of the uh, presidential candidates. You can see that that's, that's I, I don't want to name names. Some, more, some are more interesting than others. But anyway, so they, they are, uh, you look, some people, well, J. Edgar Hoover is a great example. When I say driven by this, is that means it's effortless. It's instinctual. You gain energy from it. You like doing that. And if you are not allowed to do that, you get really angry. You know, for example, we have people who are, who are driven by curiosity. And being curious, gaining knowledge is the outcome of their living. They just want to know. 
I'm one of those. I want to know. It just bugs me if I didn't know something. You know, makes you know it too. But anyway, that's that's, that's uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, but that's the people. That's that's the scientists. That's people who lie up at night and watch the sky. They wonder. I wonder why things move. And there are people who can care less about why things move. They're more romantic. They're writing about stories about the, you know how how this this star and that star may have a fight or just get married, stuff like that. It just people have a different interest. And there's some people are very interested in order. You know, have you run into people in life that would like to organize everything, color code everything, and they get really angry with you if you put a coffee cup on the wrong side of the cupboard? Have you run into those people? And they just enjoy it. They love it. They enjoy that very much. And, uh, and some people are very much interested in by saving things. And uh, they refuse to throw things away that's like 300 years old and tell you that I'm, I was going to use that tomorrow. Okay. It's a... Uh, and then you have people who are very much into social contact, family, status, vengeance, romance, you know, eating, physical activity, tranquility. People are driven by different things. And if you do not accept this, it gets very frustrating. You think everybody wants the same thing as you do in life. And it makes it very confusing life. For example, in, uh, I, I live in Eugene, Oregon. I get confused by all these people running around. We call ourselves the track town USA where Nike was invented. Everybody, you can see at 3 o'clock in the morning, someone's running. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, someone's running. And, uh, you know, from my Chinese uh, perspective, I said, what are you doing? Because normally you either run away from something, run to something. These people just run around, you know. Just, it's, uh, they, they have, there's no purpose. They just keep doing this whole thing. It's, and, then, they, and then you live, you see people here, you know, they, they fly to a place to Colorado. They, they take the lift up this hill and then they take the ski down. It's dangerous stuff, you know. Like, why would you do that? Torture yourself. But anyway, it's, uh, you know. Human beings do that, but why? People enjoy physical activity. Your ADHD kids, they get energy by moving around. They're happy about it, not me. You know, that, that, that I can't handle it. So if you think about this, combining this, this is called nature part. Nature and plus nature, this is what we come with. But these are only potentials. Only poten potentials need nurture. Needs environment, needs education to either enhance or stifle it. So, you know, you may have this potential to become artist, but unless you have opportunity to try that, you will never become artist. You won't, you won't, I, 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 I could have become a Justin Bieber if I had access to music, but never had, you know, when they're my village. So forget about that now, you know, just, uh, and, and this is something, I know this is one important, so you need that. The second thing is this, if you want to be good at something, you got to have effort. Time and effort and good teaching. You know, we, you heard about this idea called the 10,000 hours rule, right? You want to be good, something to spend 10,000 hours. But that's a kind of myth because it depends on how you do it. You know, for example, number one, what do you spend 10,000 hours on? If you spend 10,000 hours on something you are born to be talented in and you're interested in, you can become great. But if you spend something you have no idea, you have no interest, and you're not good at, you can become best, at best, mediocre. So think about me, for example. Uh, people, you know, I know people who say, let's have a growth mindset. I say, yeah, yeah, growth mindset is great, but not all the time. You know, for me, uh, people always try to say, I can teach you a thing. I say, sure you can. I'm, I'm sure you can, but I don't want to. Okay, and uh, I, can, I can teach you because I said I'm not good at sports. I can teach you through the baseball. I said, yes, you can. And I'm happy to spend 10,000 hours on play, throwing baseball. But no matter how good I am, I can never make a living by throwing baseball. Oh, that's why I never, you know, the, very few Asians tried for football scholarships. Because no matter, you, you have limitations. Do you see what I mean? I can be better than myself, but, you know, in terms of your strength, it won't be. Another point with this 10,000 hours is that 10,000 hours is not really 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is very different from one hour repeated 10,000 times. That's where teaching and learning comes in. Because if you keep playing violin the same way, the same way for 10,000 hours, you're not getting better. That's where teaching, you count variation. 10,000 hours means 10,000 different hours of practice. It's something very different. Now if we combine all of this, where does this lead us to? If you look at this thing, traditional society, truly, when those jobs, they only could use a few talents, the verbal, the numeracy, the numbers. And traditional jobs only could use a few of this passion as well. 
You cannot, not every passion is valuable in all this time. That's why we had education to homogenize. We wanted to do that. That was very good for us. I mean, I could become a great artist, but in my village, I could not make a living. Or just think about uh, uh, Lady Gaga working for Henry Ford <laughs> on the assembly line. You, you do, we did not need that. But now, as the Google card indicates, the foggy Christmas Eve has arrived for Rudolph and for everybody. So I want to make a proposal to see all this white spectrum of human talents and passions can be of value now. Can be of economical value that can help them keep, stay out of parents' basement. How did that happen? Well, that happened because of technology and the globalization. Because the technology and globalization has given us what Daniel Pink calls the age of abundance. That we have arrived at a different time. We are entered a middle class society. Once you enter a middle class society, we consume different products and services. We used to consume a lot of necessities, things that will keep you alive. Food, shelter, and clothing. Remember, we had a lot of industry around those things. A hundred years ago in the US, we spent 80, 80 percent of our income on necessities. Today we don't. We spend less than 50%. Today in America, most of us have a lot more disposable income and more leisure time. Then we consume desires, wants, psychological, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual products and services. That's very different. And psychological and spiritual is about personal. If it's personal, it's very, very individualized, and it's very diverse. People don't consume the same thing. You know, in terms of traditional food, we consume the same thing. But today, food is a personal experience. That's why the more money you pay, the less food you get. Do you guys notice that, right? It's a, no, it's an experience. It's a psychological experience. It's not a physiological experience anymore. As a result, what do we consume? We consume lots of choices in this country. And these choices <clears throat> sometimes can be just to, to tell you how shocking it is. When I was in China, I had one bar of soap to wash, wash everything of myself and my clothes and was fine, was okay. So when I came to, to the U.S. in 1992, I tried to buy something to wash my hair and I couldn't do it because I did not know what kind of hair I had. You gotta know, you gotta know, oily, normal, or dry. You gotta know, you gotta, you gotta know that. And, and then so you, you, you just create a new profession called hair consultant. And, and, then, and then just look at this thing. If you go there, if you go there, what do you see? And then I need to ask questions, should I buy the blue one or the green one or the orange one or red one, which one is better? How about the shapes of the bottle? Is the, the tall one better than the wooden? I have no idea. It's trauma has an experience, so I still don't go buy it, this stuff. It's, a, it's very hard, but do we need this to survive? No. Do we want this? Absolutely. So first thing, can we create choice? So that's the creativity. Can our students actually not to produce something, but create something? Because if you create something, that machine cannot replace. That cannot be easily replicated, be done in other places. So creativity is number one. But creativity is based on your unique talent. Look at this whole thing. What are we consuming talents? It's not only a simple chemistry job anymore, a simple packaging job. You see here, we got artists. Those are good with pictures, with the images. They, they design the different bottles, the different colors, different shapes. We need uh, a, a lot of people understand, understand plants, marketing, packaging. Do you notice this? And even people who dance. You know, how, how does hair washing have anything to do with dancing? But I have not seen a hair commercial that nobody dances with it. <laughs> you know, imagine you came from a country that had necessities. You think you wash your hair, you have to dance, right? It's uh, singers, writers, and uh, the com mass communication. So every talent has become valuable. I don't have to say more about this. Every talent is valuable. And so we see the rise of a new class of people. That the traditionally undervalued people have become more valuable. Traditional useless people have become useful. Traditional useless people. Well, for example, Kim Kardashian is a good example. <laughs> traditionally useless people have become useful. She provides a choice, entertainment. You may not like her at all, 
But you don't have to. There's plenty of people can like her. That's the reason called globalization. Globalization allows any niche talent, unique talent, to reach a very large number of people. So she may be liked by one out of 10,000 people. I don't know, maybe not even that many. But, uh, but if she stayed in a city of 10,000 people, no technology, no, no reaching out to other places, that's of no value. But now she could reach 2 billion people, 3 billion people. That's valuable. Technology, age of abundance, and globalization has redefined the value of talents. If Kim Kardashian is useful, anyone can be useful. That's the <laughs> conclusion of the, of, of the day. So what, what, where do we go with this? We have to think about creativity, uniqueness. This is very important. To think about how unique you are to capitalize on your strength. We also have to think about the idea of entrepreneur thinking. You have to assume everybody has to have a startup mindset. They, we, ha we cannot continue to prepare employees anymore. We have to think about preparing entrepreneurs. Because everybody needs to have an entrepreneurial mindset. The entrepreneurial mindset comes from, you know, not only for people to, who want to start businesses. You want to have a charitable organization. We call them social entrepreneurs. If you want to work within a company, we need your entrepreneurial minded employees. We call them intrapreneurs. If you work in the policy, public sector, we call you policy entrepreneur. And entrepreneurs are very different. Entrepreneurs focus a lot more on these different kind of qualities of uh, uniqueness, of uh, friends, of social intelligence, risk taking, all of those things. So we talk a lot about entrepreneurial mindset, about creativity. And human beings, by the way, actually are born with a lot of creativity. We are very creative. But our education, typically in the traditional way, since we do not value creativity, we see creativity decline. Actually, we want to make children less creative in our schools so they can comply. You know, we do not need a creative employees in the traditional sense. They just need to follow orders. That's why you know, some of the data show in the age five, 98% of our children are creative at the genius level, and they lose creativity after five years in our schools. We lose a lot of, lot of them. We continue to lose. About 10% are left when they age 15. The decline is third, fourth grade. And of course, you continue to decline until you about to retire. I think, Diane, you just retired. You say your creativity bounces back. It's a, creativity comes back. Why? Because creativity is not only cognitive, it is psychological. It is by teaching students, we actually lose creativity. And there is an interesting uh, number of studies have shown now how early teaching, giving children knowledge too early, you stifle their creativity and curiosity. There's a lot of studies showing this whole thing. So this is what I would call a very interesting concept called the side effects idea. The side effects of education. That is, when you do something, you will lose something. I want us as education leaders to be very aware of this. You cannot have everything. It's, there's no free lunch. Everything comes at a cost. The earlier you teach about knowledge, direct teaching of knowledge, can improve your test scores, but truly damages curiosity and creativity, side effects. You know, in, in medicine, you buy a bottle of medicine, there's always a warning label, says, you know, Tylenol says, you know, might, this cures a running nose, but might cause a bleeding stomach. In education, you ha I have never seen those kind of uh, 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 warning labels for education products, policies, or curriculum. I, I, I know for sure some of the early reading programs should come with a warning label that says that this might improve your test scores on park, but may make your children hate reading forever. It's very possible. And I've seen this in, in many different countries. For example, we've seen a lot of international data, which we always see America's students is always worse than uh, other, uh, other countries' test scores. You know, we, we do a big reform in education because in, we're losing uh, our performance on international tests against other countries. So that's why you always heard this idea that oh, American education is in decline, it's getting worse based on international test scores. I can tell you responsibly, based on the massive amount of data, to see American education, in terms of international test scores or ranking, is not getting worse, is not in decline. It has always been bad. It has been bad for a long time, since 1960s. American students have underperformed everybody. 1964, the first international mathematics study, American students 
12th graders scored ranked 12th out of 12 countries, then that's pretty bad. And you can't get worse than this whole list. And so we had a bad start. Now you wonder why America is still here. This is a, not a Canadian question, but it's, a, it's actually a true American question. It's an education question because of the side effects that American students in 2003, we saw this data showing that American kids, uh, and this is a math called TIMS, Trends International Mathematics Science Study, Americans are scored way below Asian countries, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Japan. But on this test, they ask another question called, remember those entrepreneurial qualities? Confidence. And as you can imagine on the test, American students are really bad in exams, test scores, math, but they are very confident about their math abilities. They are outconfident everybody. This is what America gets, you know, so that's why we, we see all this, this general idea of, uh, and so now this, this trend, this trend has continued, has continued for a long time, and that is 2003, uh, 2011 data shows the same thing. All the Asian countries outscore US, UK, and uh, Australia, and, but their confidence is way below this country, students' confidence, and uh, this confidence is always negative correlation. Test scores versus non-cognitive skills. And non-cognitive skills transferred in a PISA test, PISA, for example, of this data, red bar indicates their test scores of math on the PISA, but the blue bar is the entrepreneurial confidence. And it shows negative correlation. Countries with high PISA scores have lower entrepreneurship confidence. That's Finland was number one in, uh, in science, at the, the first PISA, but their students lack interest in science. And we see that all over the world, this, this thing about this sacrifice. So are we sacrificing creativity? Are we sacrificing entrepreneurship? Are we sacrificing individual strength? By following the old model of trying to fix everybody, that's deficit model. Maybe in order to prepare the entrepreneurial, the creative, and the unique individual, we need to demand everybody to rethink about education for a new paradigm, which I would call strength-based. Strength-based education. That is going to enable us to change our education, to think about the curriculum not as a prescription, but rather follows the child. That's $100,000 can buy personalized education for every child. We need to move to our students to engage and to think about how to become great and how their greatness can be of value to others. That's why I propose a new pedagogy called product-oriented learning. And all of this needs to happen in the context of globalization. And that is also, think about, co corresponds with some of the new movement in science about an education is called The End of Average. This is a great book by Todd Rose at Harvard University. It wrote about how there's no average brain, average individual. Everybody has to be unique, great, and successful in their own way. And just to end, how to keep your kids out of your basement? That's the question we started. I think it's fairly simple that education that enhances individual strength, an education that preserves and encourages students to be entrepreneurial, to imagine they have to create jobs and opportunities for themselves and for other people, an education that ensures and stimulates children to create solutions, to identify problems, and serve other people will keep our children out of our basement. Thank you. Thank you. That's my, uh, if you want to download the slides, that's where you can find it. Thank you. Please join me once again in thanking Dr. Zhao. Thank you for sharing.